So from the time of the fall, when Adam and Eve chose to sin against God, from the time of the first temptation, the first deception, the first choice that went against uh, the nature and, and preference of God himself, the first sin, the first consequence, the first curse, Adam and Eve, humanity was cursed. And because God was perfect, because he was holy, because he was God, he had to punish sin, but because he was loving and merciful, he put a plan in place. And that plan that he put in place wasn't really apparently known to humans right at the very beginning, but was unfolded over time. A plan that we can see pretty clearly because we have scripture and history and we can look back and understand the thread throughout our times, humankind, the thread that points toward Jesus, but one that they were figuring out as they went. You and I, we can look back with gratitude and thanksgiving because Jesus Christ is our Messiah, our Savior, Christ the Lord. We believe that Jesus paid the price for our sins, that he lived a perfect life and died a death that he didn't deserve, that he rose again three days later, defeated sin, Satan, and death once and for all, providing the way for you and I to be with him forever in eternity. But for years and years and years, people were figuring it out. There was revelation through the prophets, through the Holy Spirit, through the pens of men, as they talked about things like the law, how to keep God happy temporarily, how to obey, reinforcing the fact that it was impossible for us to be good enough, moral enough, wise enough, pure enough to work our way to being right with God. The Bible tells us that right before Jesus was born, that there was a period of silence for hundreds of years where all of creation, the entire world waited and nothing seemed to happen. But then Jesus was born, born 100% God and 100% man, a miracle, lived a perfect life, gathered around him a group of unlikely men and likely some women with the men who hung out with him and tried to figure out what his kingdom was all about. And so for a period of about three years, Jesus taught, he did miracles, he pointed people toward the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But they still didn't understand. Jesus knew after the end of his three-year ministry that his time was coming to an end here on earth before he died on the cross, rose again, and then ascended into heaven. And he knew that he was leaving this mission with a bunch of people who were still a little slow to embrace it. They would say things like, Jesus, I believe, but you gotta give me a little more faith because I don't really understand. Or, oh, now I finally understand who you are, Jesus. And then they would step back and go, wait a second, what did you say? They were getting it. They were people who wanted to have faith, but they were such a diverse group like us in here. There were some who were learned, smart. They'd been exposed to all kinds of, of different schools of thought, religion, and philosophy. There were some who were religious terrorists. There were some who were just blue collar folk that worked the salt of the earth that kept society moving together trying to figure out what is this gospel, Jesus, and what do we have to do about it? So Jesus gathered them together at this very last moment, one of the last times he was gonna be with them. And what we call the Last Supper, we have the captions in our Bible that give us little captions in bold that tell us what the next section of scripture is going to be. But some people call it communion. Some people call it the Eucharist. Jesus gathered them together to remember a festival, a ceremony. Now the Jews would have been practicing this Passover, this ceremony, this festival, they would have been doing this every year from the time they were born because they were devout and they wanted to be obedient to the law. So they would get together and they would have dinner together. The head of the household would lead the Passover dinner. And it's probably a little different than the dinners that you have at your house. They had a, a program. They had a system, an order that they followed. And the whole thing was set up to remember an event that had happened in the past. When the children of Israel were held captive in Egypt, and God sent Moses and God sent the plagues and ultimately Pharaoh let the children of Israel go. And they were remembering this. And they would do several things in this Passover meal. Many Jews still practice it today. It's evolved over time. 
but there were four cups of wine and they would drink these four cups at four strategic times during the meal. And they would have bread and the bread would be an unleavened bread. Because if you remember the story in Exodus, when the children of Israel were instructed to leave Egypt, they had to leave in a hurry because Pharaoh would likely change his mind and not let them go. And so they weren't even allowed to put the leaven in the bread. They would start off by drinking a cup of wine and each cup had a meaning or a symbol behind it. And Exodus 6 tells us about these symbols or these meanings. It represented the fact that God was in fact going to remove Israel from Egypt. And the second cup, by the way, would happen later. And that signified that Egypt would no longer, Israel would no longer be slaves. The third cup, which you'll see later, was a cup that symbolized that Israel in fact would have a redeemer. And then the last cup was something that symbolized the foreshadowing, the looking forward to God's people all being together and being together forever. But they would start the meal off with one cup of wine. And then after the cup of wine, they'd sanitize their hands. And I like that part because I'm a, a little bit of a germaphobe. So they pass the Purell, Purell around and, and sanitize the hands. And then they would have an appetizer of some sort of a vegetable. And they would put some things in the vegetable that were, that were well, they'd put a lot of salt in it. And when they ate this vegetable, they would say to each other, this is salty. And it would remind them of the tears of the slaves when, when the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. And then they would break the bread. The head of household as he broke the bread would be a symbolic entrance into the symbolic side of this Passover meal. And then they would have the next cup of wine, this second cup, and they would begin to tell the story of the Exodus where the children of Israel left Egypt and talk about the miracles and talk about the plagues and talk about how great God was. And they would remember, and they would remember well. Well, the Passover was followed meticulously. It was tradition, it was law. And Jesus was meeting with his disciples. They were having Passover together. But this was the last Passover that would ever be like the Passover had been for the previous hundreds of years. Jesus was going to change everything. And the disciples were still trying to understand. So put yourself in their shoes or their sandals as they are gathered together in an upper room with the person who they've chosen to trust and chosen to love, Jesus. Believing that he is who he says he is, but still struggling just like you and I would and sometimes do. The plot was thickening, the time was here, and Jesus was giving them his final object lesson. Join with me, let's look together at Matthew 26. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread. Remember the bread that I told you about? And he, after he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat, this is my body. Now that is a difficult statement to make. It's a, a statement that we understand looking back, but his disciples you know, probably were a little taken back. If you can imagine yourself sitting there at dinner and somebody says something that sounds a little bit, um, a little, I don't know. I mean, it sounds a little bit gross. It sounds a little hardcore and we don't understand it because we live in a society much different than the disciples. They lived in a society a little bit more, well, they had context and I'll explain that to you. But Jesus right here, was um, getting their attention. And he says, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I won't drink from the fruit of this vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Now that's pretty simple, it's complicated to us, but what this literally means is that Jesus had arrived at the third cup of wine in the Passover, where he had talked about the fact that there will be a redeemer, somebody to free the children of Israel and pay the penalty for their sins. And then he stopped because they were expecting that last cup right at the end of dinner where they go out and they sing a song and they do their thing. And he said, I'm not gonna finish it with you. And it was the greatest ellipsis of all times 
He created this huge dot, 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 like you're texting somebody and you're waiting for a reply or a response. And he left them hanging in the balance. And so they said, we have to know more, but you and I, of course, have to know more because we don't even have the benefit of understanding, well, the, the world that they lived in. So let me try to explain to you how powerful this was. Jesus was telling them, this Passover is no longer about the past. It's no longer about history. It's about me. Now, you may not think that's that big of a deal because you and I, we know who Jesus is and we have the whole scriptures. We read about him. But to them, this was potentially blasphemous. He was saying, listen, don't worry about Moses. We respect what happened. What happened was true. What happened was real. But we're no longer going to remember and celebrate in the same way. I have come to establish the new covenant. So what's a covenant? I mean, you and I have covenants that we've entered into. I entered into a marriage covenant with my wife. We have covenants that we make with different people, commitment covenant. You know, we use different words. But there were three types of covenant that were common in ancient history, in this particular ancient history, in the Jewish world. And I want to explain them to you because this is how the disciples would have perceived what Jesus is saying. And this is the good news of Jesus Christ. The first type of covenant pretty simple. It was called a bilateral parity covenant. Now, there's not going to be a test later. You don't have to take notes on this. It really doesn't matter, but it was a covenant made between two people who were equal. What's that look like? Well, I bought a house. I've sold houses. You make a covenant or a commitment. In Arkansas, I sold a house that we had remodeled the basement on, and I had built an entire room around a pool table that I purchased at an auction that was a special pool table to me. When I sold the house, we were going back and forth through my realtor and their realtor, and I was reading the contract to sell my house on my phone, my cell phone. Don't do that if you're trying to sell a home. Look at things in a larger perspective than your cell phone. I got preoccupied on the price. And so when I had the price offered to me that I wanted, I accepted the contract. And then I found out that the fine print they'd put in was that they got to keep my pool table and all my stuff. And I didn't mean to sell my pool table. Now, too bad, so sad, right? I'm an adult. I was able to examine the contract. I had something to offer the equation. It was even, it was 50-50. We could you know, shake hands and covenants were made that way all the time. Sometimes they exchanged land, sometimes gifts, sometimes daughters. It was a different time. It was weird um, that they would make covenants among equals. They understood that covenant. The second type of covenant was called a bilateral suzerainty covenant. Don't worry about the words. This means that there's a sovereign and a vassal. This means, let me explain it this way. How many of you have had kids, have been around kids, have ever seen a kid drive, learning to drive? Yeah, raise your hands. I just want to know you're getting, yeah, raise your hand. All of us, right? Kids, when they drive, I had two boys, still do. When both of them learned to drive, it was scary. And um, they didn't have anything, my boys. They were broke, right? I mean, they were, they were broke. I had a car. They wanted to borrow my car. So I had rules. I was the dad. I was the sovereign, so to speak. Richard, you can drive my car. Do not get it dirty. Do not take it into the mud. It was a four-wheel drive. Do not have more than one friend at a time. Be back by 11 with a full tank of gas. If you're not back by 11 with a full tank of gas, you won't drive it again for a week, right? Because that's the rule. Now, what did Richard have, my oldest son, to bring to the occasion? Nothing. He was broke. He didn't own a vehicle. He lived in my home. So my rules had to be good enough for him. Or do you know what would happen to Richard? He would walk. So he said, sure, I'll do what you want because you're my dad not because he loved me, I think he does, but because that's the only way he could drive. Well, that was the agreement that God had made with the Old Testament Jews. They were the subjects that he was the sovereign. And if they obeyed him, their crops would grow, their people would be preserved, a nation would come from them, they would be successful in battle. And if they disobeyed, there was punishment, sometimes slavery, sometimes famine. And that was the covenant that they understood. An insurmountable debt that humans had toward God. And they just chipped away at it through a sacrificial system, keeping the law, obeying the promise, one year to the next, 
knowing that nothing that they could ever do would be good enough to satisfy the sin. And then there's a third type of covenant. But before we get to the third type of covenant, when a person would make a covenant with somebody else, especially in the Old Testament, and this will help you when you read the Old Testament, because there's all kinds of things in there that we don't understand. We scratch our head and we're like, this is gross. It doesn't make sense. Um, if you make an agreement with the neighbor and you're gonna purchase their home, or maybe you go to work for somebody and realize they're now your boss and you wanna seal the covenant, what you would have to do is you would take their cat or their dog or their cow or their goat and you would cut it all the way down the middle into two pieces, all the way down, and you'd lay the pieces on the ground. Now, sometimes there were multiple pieces of um, multiple animals, depends on how big the, the agreement is and the covenant is. But what they would do literally with the two pieces of the dead animal, with the body and the blood, is the two parties would walk through each side of the animal, signifying their agreement to the covenant and stating, may it be it unto me, as it is with this unfortunate animal, if I violate the terms of our, of our agreement. The end of Genesis, when God's talking to Abraham, or in Genesis, there's a covenant made about God establishing his people, a nation. And when you read it, depends on what version you read it in, the Bible talks about how there are pieces of animals that Abraham chose not to walk between because he was agreeing, he was understanding he was symbolizing the fact that humans can't pay the debt we owe to God and that there's some things that God just has to do for us. Well, this third type of covenant is the type of covenant that Jesus is talking about. And it's the new covenant, a new way of relating to God, a new way of viewing ourselves and our relationship. And this is called the promissory covenant. And this covenant is very simply the covenant made when one person has everything and the other person has absolutely nothing and it's okay. When one person says, I am going to do it all for you because I love you. And then this other person says, well, I don't have anything to offer back. Well, that's the very nature of the new covenant. Because of God's love for us, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, offering up his body and his blood to pay the price for our sins that we can't pay to cover the debt that seemed insurmountable and to seal the deal of the new covenant, this promissory covenant foreshadowed by Jeremiah. As he said, one day God will write the law on our hearts. A covenant of conscience and of commitment. So what does God ask for us in return. He asks for our faith, for our hearts, for our obedience. He asks for our love. Now it doesn't do any of the work. All of the work's been done, but it allows us to enter into this work in a right relationship with Jesus, who's completed everything necessary for us to be right with God. So the disciples were sitting around a table, reclining, listening to a very powerful object lesson where Jesus was literally symbolically showing them that this is the time when everything's changed. And when you gathered them in, gathered them in and he said, it's really good news. That's the reason we can be thankful this Thanksgiving season. 
So I'm going to pray. Our worship team's going to come and they're going to lead us in some songs. Now, I gave you this part of the message to prime the pump. I gave it to you to prime the pump because I want you to be in the right frame of mind, the right state of heart. When we sing these songs, when you're thinking the thoughts that you'll be thinking, I want you to think about all the reasons that you have to be thankful to God. I want you to think about all the ways that you've been blessed. I want you to think about who he is and what he's done for us and how much we didn't deserve it. And then we're gonna come back together and I'm gonna give you some instructions. And together, we'll celebrate this new covenant, this promise, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, thank you for the time we've already spent this morning. So it's pretty simple, really. The way that we started, humans, Adam and Eve, they started the way we were supposed to start, enjoying God with um, all of their senses, no hindrance, nothing in between, almost impossible to imagine what that would have been like. To walk and talk with God, to be able to hear him, to meet with him without sin. But as we talked about, they sinned and they started it, but you and I are pretty good at continuing it. And if they hadn't done it, we would have done it because people for whatever reason just had a predisposition that direction. So you have God over here on one stool who didn't intend for it to be this way but his perfection and his holiness what like, caused him to give consequences for sin. And so the curse separated humans and God by a distance that there was, it was impossible to, to navigate. How do you make the relationship right? You can't. What can I do? Nothing lost, alone, helpless, broken, and destined to spend eternity that way. But the story wasn't over. We know that God, because he was also loving and he was merciful, put this plan in place so that the separation between God and humans, us, wouldn't have to stay that way. So very simply, he sent Jesus, his son, also being God to come and live among us or with us to show us what God looks like, what he cares about and to invite us to get off of our stool to become part of his plan. And he bridged that gap. He made the first move. It's the covenant that he's talking about. And so the question is, how do I do that? And Jesus repeats the invitation time and time again throughout the New Testament, follow me. What's it mean to follow you? How do, I, how do I follow you? So you deny yourself. What's that mean, Jesus? It's pretty simple. It means to admit that I've blown it, that I've messed up, that there's no way I can bridge this gap. There's no way I can undo all of the damage that's been done by others, myself. I'm sinful. I've had thoughts, actions, attitudes displeasing to God. I don't, I don't want them anymore. I'm sorry for that. I confess it. So what else do you do, Jesus? He says, well, you have to believe in me. But it's not enough. Because the Bible tells us that even the demons believe who Jesus is and they tremble. He said, you have to be willing to come and to live a different way. Give me everything you are. And in return, I'll give you a life that you never thought possible. And in this last supper, Jesus was demonstrating symbolically the work that it was going to take to seal the deal so that you and I can have lives full of meaning and hope and freedom and purpose no longer living for ourselves, but living for Jesus. 
no longer having to answer the questions about who we used to be, the thoughts that we've had, the things that we've done, the mistakes of the past, having somebody who chooses to see us for who we are and who we will become. The disciples, they thought too good to be true. You and I sometimes think too good to be true, but Jesus said it is true and it's my promise in this new covenant. And so they had this Passover meal together and the cup demonstrated the blood that would be poured. The cracker, the bread, demonstrated the body that would be offered up, the penalty that would be paid, the deal that would be cut. And then Jesus said to his disciples, this is my paraphrase, when you go from here, there are gonna be things you see, experience. People are gonna say things to you. The world is created in such a way it's gonna try to draw you from me. And you have to remember, you gotta remember this moment. You have to remember who I am because we, we forget. And so he said, I want you to do this and I want you to do it in remembrance of me, in rededication to me, re-upping that relationship. Thank you for saving me, God. I would do it all over again, just like I did whenever that time was. Some churches practice what they call a closed communion. We don't. I don't believe that the Bible teaches that you have to be a member of a certain church to participate in the Lord's Supper. What I do believe is the Bible teaches that to participate in the Lord's Supper, we should be members of the body of Christ people who've made this decision, confessed their sin, believed who Jesus is and chosen to live our lives as best we can under his control. And then when we participate, we believe that the Bible teaches that these elements, the juice and the cracker are simply symbolic of the blood and the body of Christ. And that symbolically we are identifying with him and letting him know that our hearts are in the same condition that they were when we came to him in the first place. So here's what I want you to do. Just over the next couple of minutes, there's gonna be some music that plays in the background. And I want you to examine your heart. That sounds churchy, doesn't it? Um, if, if you're a kid, it's like, think about what you did, right? I mean, you, know, you, just think about your, you just think about your life, right? And you just ask God, you're like, God, look, I, I, you know, praying sometimes seems a little difficult to me. Um, but I know that I can talk to you and I know that you've installed in me the ability to hear from you. God's told us that. King David, he said, look, point out the things in me, God, that I know are wrong and let me deal with those things, but point out those things that are subtle that I don't even know about. Thoughts, actions, attitudes, displeasing to the Lord, things that have caused us to drift, things that may make our heart not like it was that first time we came to Christ. And we deal with those when God points them out. For some, it may be a relationship, a person, something you need to make right before you can continue, and that's okay. The Apostle Paul tells us in some of his instructions that if there's things in your life you can't get right that God points out, just don't participate. Go make them right, and next time you can celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's between you and Jesus. It's certainly no judgment from me or anyone in this room. And that after you contemplate, after you examine your hearts, we go into a time of thanksgiving. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. God, thank you for sending your son to make all of this make sense. Thank you for giving me hope and thank you for giving me meaning, whatever yours is. And then I'll come or Ashley will come after you've contemplated and gone through the a few minutes of just between you and God and she'll invite you to participate in the Lord's Supper. Now we do it, we're very casual, we're family. When we invite you, when Ashley comes and gives you these instructions, you'll just step up and you'll come to the front here down these aisles on the sides and, and we'll have some deacons and some SLT servant leadership team here and they'll hand you the cracker and the juice. You can linger at the front if you'd like to, you can pray, you can go back to your seats, you can take it as a family, you can take it by yourself, you can do it among friends. It doesn't matter, it's between you and God, there'll be no further instructions, but we do it in remembrance and we do it because of what he's done. So I'm gonna pray for you. You're going to contemplate, reflect and give thanks. And then Ashley will tell you when it's time for us to participate. God, thank you. Well, we just have a few days before Thanksgiving and I wanna just encourage you don't get caught up in 
the stresses that can accompany holidays because there's lots. We call it fun, but it can also be stressful. And um, it can be both, I guess, fun and stressful. But what I want to remind you and what I want to encourage you to do is to take some time and to be thankful. I want you to think about the things that you're thankful for uh, regarding your relationship with Jesus. What are you thankful to God for or about? And I want you to tell him. I also want you to think about the things that you're thankful for, for the people who are around you and close to you in your life. And this one's a little harder for some of you. I want you to tell them because unexpressed or inexpressed gratitude can be perceived as ingratitude. The people who are around you, who are close to you, don't just assume they know that you're thankful for them. Make a point to tell them because perceived ingratitude can become bitterness and distance over time. So let's make the most out of this Thanksgiving. And I can't wait to see you next Sunday. There are no throwaway services at Capital City Church. I can't wait to bring the message next Sunday that God has been putting on my heart already. I can't wait to see you here in seven days. Happy Thanksgiving. Stand with me if you would.